All right. Now, for um, fear of for repeating myself, for people taking classes with me in the past, I want to start at the beginning and bring us down to the scrolls, so that uh, you all are starting from the same place. Because a lot of people I find actually, though they think they know the Bible or something about this history, know almost nothing. So uh, I can't teach you everything in one moment or on one foot. But let's start with Adam, shall we? That's where the Bible starts. By the way, I don't know when he lived. But one thing which will become important when we move along here is that the name Adam means also what in Hebrew? Man. So Adam and man are the same thing. Now, I, 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 I am, so we call the first man Adam, but he's also um, the name for all man or humankind, if you want. I don't want to get sexist about this or chauvinist or whatever. But ancients, you know, did emphasize maleness, let's face it. Uh, you can attack them or think whatever you want, but I'm not sure it's much better today when everything is being feminized either. I mean, I don't know if the world's a better place, so I, I can't judge. I'll have to wait another 500 years to tell. So today everything, you know, is like, well, I think it's kind of like totally womanized now in the sense that women are dominant uh, in culture and things like that. If you get to write a book and you're a woman, you get published much quicker than a man. You apply for a teaching job someplace in this university or others, you get hired much, 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 much quicker. I told all my sons, don't even bother going into academia, you know, unless you're, you got some really thing going for you or know how to network, you might as well forget it. And uh, so on and so forth. So, you know, I'm not trying to put that down. I'm just saying that ancient man had one universe, we have another one. So I, I don't want to put ancient man or women kind down either. That's how they looked at the world. So it was a masculine dominated world for good or for bad. Um, why is Adam important? In terms of what we're going to do when we get to Daniel, what's the big prophecy in Daniel? That is the whole ball of wax. One of the main reasons for reading Daniel, uh, something the New Testament like totally picks up on and uh, you know runs with and makes a huge deal out of. And, um, well, I don't know if the scrolls are so interested in it, but they do like Daniel. Scrolls, Daniel's an important book in the Dead Sea Scrolls. First of all, what people don't realize is Daniel isn't even written in Hebrew. It's written in Aramaic. People say, this is the Hebrew Bible. Well, that's a misnomer, too. They want to change the word from Old Testament to that. That's the, the present scholarly sort of... Uh, pre well, Daniel is an Aramaic book, so how is it the Hebrew Bible? You know, it's a collection of books. Some of them are Hebrew, most of them are Hebrew, but some are not. Or well, at least one isn't. I think there may be another one that is not to check it out. But uh, in any case, Daniel doesn't even use Adam. Daniel uses Bar for a son of man. Ben-Adam is son of man in in, in Hebrew, bar enosh, the word for man in Aramaic is son of man in Aramaic. So actually, Daniel says, and I saw one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. I saw one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. That's the whole thing in Daniel, isn't it? How does the New Testament run with that? How do the Gospels run with that? I don't know if Paul runs with it so much, but the Gospels run with it. How do the Gospels run with it? What do the Gospels say? Oh, it's over and over again. The Son of Man came drinking. The Son of Man came drinking and eating. The Son of Man was a glutton. You will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. How many familiar with those kind of passages in the Gospel? What? You've never heard those passages? You've been to churches? Never heard those passages? Come on, you're fooling me. You just don't want to admit it. I know, I know, I know. Well, to my mind, that shows that the Gospels, first of all, are written by people who don't know Hebrew or Aramaic and are overseas origin. And actually, 
just from that alone, I know I'm pushing a lot in that, but actually know very little about what's going on in Palestine at all. Most of what they're talking about is like poorly digested hearsay and so on. Now, I'm not saying there was no Jesus or there is a Jesus, but I don't think if there was a Jesus, he spat in someone's, he spat in someone's eye or in someone's ear and it was cured or something. Yeah, you say, no, that's not in the gospel. Oh, yes, it is. And I don't think that there's a Jesus who says, don't wash your hands before eating. That's in the, that's in the gospels too. Why? Why would I say that he didn't say that? Because people are putting their own ideas into Jesus' mouth. They say, oh, they wouldn't do that. Well, that's what people did in ancient times. People always used figures of some authority and importance to put their own, uh, to put their own sayings and ideas in, in that person's mouth. So the whole problem of the historical Jesus, and don't be offended by what I'm telling you, I'm trying to cover a lot of ground quickly, and I wish someone had told me this when I was 25, would have saved me a lot of trouble. I didn't really discover these things until I was about 45. I didn't know the nature of the literature that I was dealing with. So, the whole thing at that time was to get yourself prestige. We didn't have Britney Spears who'd go on the, uh, you know, um, whatever those awards were and be half naked and be chubby so that the newspapers would cover her from end to end and six months from now she's going to come out all thin so that, uh, you know, so she gets a double whammy PR uh, whack out of the whole thing. Uh, you know, she's, uh, she's way ahead of us and, and uh, you guys, but she's covered from the end, one end of the globe to the other because she was a little chubby. And, uh, you know, last time was cutting off her hair or something. She knows how to play this game to the hilt, you know? So uh, she did that on purpose, and uh, she'll come out and do something else pretty soon and so on to keep it in the news. So, you know, we ancients didn't have that. So if you were unknown, you were unknown. How'd you get known? You put your ideas under someone who was known's egus or, uh, or, or name. Uh, we have a whole series of books written under whose name? In the Dead Sea Scrolls and in a lot of churches, what we call apocryphal literature. I told you a little bit about apocryphal literature last time. I'll try to tell you more this time. But we have a whole series of uh, books written under other people's names, and we actually um, refer to these things often as pseudo bibliography. I think I probably spelled that wrong. Pseudo, pseudo, I guess it's pseudo, I don't know, I think it's like a pseudopigraphy, I know it's not that way, so pseudopigraphic is not the end of it. I just emphasize the pseudo, since you guys know what pseudo means, false writings, false or under a false pen name. We have a whole series of books like that. So one of them is, I was trying to elicit when I asked the question, I think I mentioned it last time, but if I didn't, why, if I mentioned it last time, I sometimes don't remember because I got two classes I'm teaching and I forget which one I mentioned it. Why um, would um, someone want to use Enoch to write their, obviously Enoch didn't write any books. He's the like third or fifth man or sixth man, I don't know, after Adam in the genealogical line, living for how many years? I think 777 or something like that. Great number. 777, come 777, good number for dice, and that, that's really why 7 is so important, as uh, we'll find out, I think. Why is uh, 7 important in dice? Because it's the number that most frequently comes up, isn't it? You've got two cubes of dice, so 7 is 6, 1, 5, 2, 4, 3, and so on. No other number has the frequency of 7. Oh, well, it's not as simple as that. Mix that with the phases of the moon, I think you've got it, why seven is such an important number for the ancients. 